Full of hope, Edmund swallowed a few mouthfuls of bread and water, and, thanks to the vigor of his constitution, found himself well-nigh recovered. The day passed away in utter silence. Night came without recurrence of the noise. It is a prisoner, said Edmund joyfully. His brain was on fire, and life and energy returned. The night passed in perfect silence. Edmund did not close his eyes. In the morning the jailer brought him fresh provisions. He had already devoured those of the previous day. He ate these listening anxiously for the sound, walking round and round his cell. At intervals he listened to learn if the noise had not begun again, and grew impatient at the prudence of the prisoner, who did not guess he had been disturbed by a captive as anxious for liberty as himself. Three days passed seventy-two long tedious hours which he counted off by minutes. At length one evening, as the jailer was visiting him for the last time that night dance with his ear, he moved away, walked up and down his cell to collect his thoughts, and then went back and listened. The matter was no longer doubtful. Something was at work on the other side of the wall. The prisoner had discovered the danger, and had substituted a lever for a chisel. Encouraged by this discovery, Edmund determined to assist the indefatigable laborer. He began by moving his bed, and looked around for anything with which he could pierce the wall, penetrate the moist cement, and displace a stone. He saw nothing. He had no knife or sharp instrument. The window grating was of iron, but he had too often assured himself of its solidity. All his furniture consisted of a bed, a chair, a table, a pail, and a jug. The bed had iron clamps, but they were screwed to the wood, and it would have required a screwdriver to take them off. The table and chair had nothing. The pail had once possessed a handle, but that had been removed. 189M Dance had but one resource, which was to break the jug, and with one of the sharp fragments attack the wall. He let the jug fall on the floor, and it broke in pieces. Dance concealed two or three of the sharpest fragments in his bed, leaving the rest on the floor. The breaking of his jug was too natural an accident to excite suspicion. Edmund had all the night to work in, but in the darkness he could not do much, and he soon felt that he was working against something very hard. He pushed back his bed and waited for day. All night he heard the subterranean workmen, who continued to mine his way. Day came, the jailer entered. Dance told him that the jug had fallen from his hands while he was drinking, and the jailer went grumblingly to fetch another, without giving himself the trouble to remove the fragments of the broken one. He returned speedily, advised the prisoner to be more careful, and departed. Dance heard joyfully the key grate in the lock. He listened until the sound of steps died away, and then, hastily displacing his bed, saw by the faint light that the damp had rendered it friable, and Dance was able to break it off in small morsels, it is true, but at the end of half an hour he had scraped off a handful. A mathematician might have... The prisoner reproached himself with not having thus employed the hours he had passed in vain hopes, prayer, and despondency. During the six years that he had been imprisoned, what might he not have accomplished? This idea imparted new energy, and in three days he had succeeded, with the utmost precaution. The wall was built of rough stones, among which, to give strength to the structure, blocks of hewn stone were at intervals embedded. It was one of these he had uncovered, and which he must remove from its socket. Dance strove to do this with his nails, but they were too weak. The fragments of the jug broke, and after an hour of useless toil, Dance paused with anguish on his brow. Was he to be thus stopped at the beginning, and was he to wait inactive until his fellow workmen had completed his task? Suddenly an idea occurred to him, he smiled, and the perspiration The jailer always brought Dance soup in an iron saucepan. This saucepan contained soup for both prisoners, for Dance had noticed that it was either quite full or half empty. The handle of this saucepan was of iron. Dance would have given ten years of his life in exchange for it. 
191. The jailer was accustomed to pour the contents of the saucepan into Dant's plate, and Dant, after eating his soup with a wooden spoon, washed the plate, which thus served. Now, when evening came, Dant put his plate on the ground near the door. The jailer, as he entered, stepped on it and broke it. This time he could not blame Dant. He was wrong to leave it there, but the jailer was wrong not to have looked before him. The jailer, therefore, only grumbled. Then he looked about for something to pour the soup into. Dante's entire dinner service consisted of one plate. There was no alternative. Leave the saucepan, said Dance. You can take it away when you bring me my breakfast. This advice was to the jailer's taste, as it spared him the necessity of making another trip. He left the saucepan. Dance was beside himself with joy. He rapidly devoured his food, and after waiting an hour, lest the jailer should change his mind and return, he removed his bed, took the handle of the saucepan, inserted the point. A slight oscillation showed Dance that all went well. At the end of an hour, the stone was extricated from the wall, leaving a cavity a foot and a half in diameter. Dance carefully collected the plaster, carried it into the corner of his cell and covered it with earth. Then, wishing to make the best use of his time while he had the means of labor, he continued to work without ceasing. At the dawn of day he replaced the stone, pushed his bed against the wall, and lay down. The breakfast consisted of a piece of bread. The jailer entered and placed the bread on the table. Well, don't you intend to bring me another plate? said Dance. No, replied the turnkey. You destroy everything. First you break your jug, then you make me break your plate. If all the prisoners followed your example, the government would be ruined. I shall leave you the saucepan and pour your soup into that. So for the future I hope you will not be so destructive. Dance raised his eyes to heaven and clasped his hands beneath the coverlet. He felt more gratitude for the possession of this piece of iron than he had ever felt for anything. He had noticed, however, that the prisoner on the other side had ceased to labor. No matter. This was a greater reason for proceeding. If his neighbor would not come to him, he would go to him. All day he toiled on untiringly, and by the evening he had succeeded in extracting ten handfuls of plaster and fragments of stone. When the hour for his jailer's visit arrived, Dance straightened the handle of the saucepan as well as he could, and placed it in its accustomed place. The turnkey poured his ration of soup into it, together with the fish. For thrice a week the prisoners were deprived of meat. This would have been a method of reckoning time, had not Dance long ceased to do so. Having poured out the soup, the turnkey retired. Dance wished to ascertain whether his neighbor had really ceased to work. He listened, all was silent, as it had been for the last three days. Dance sighed. It was evident that his neighbor distrusted him. However, he toiled on all the night without being discouraged, but after two or three hours he encountered an obstacle. The iron made no impression, but met with a smooth surface. Dance touched it, and found that it was a beam. This beam crossed, or rather blocked up, the hole Dance had made. It was necessary, therefore, to dig above or under it. The unhappy young man had not thought of this. Oh, my God, my God, murmured he, I have so earnestly prayed to you that I hoped my prayers had been heard. After having deprived me of my liberty, after having deprived me of death, after having recalled me to existence, my God, have pity on me. And Edmund's hair stood on end, and he rose to his knees. I said he, I hear a human voice. Edmund had not heard anyone speak save his jailer for four or five years. And a jailer is no man to a prisoner. He is in the name of heaven, cried Dance, speak again, though the sound of your voice terrifies me. Who are you, who are you, said the voice. An unhappy prisoner, replied Dance, who made no hesitation in answering. Of what country? A Frenchman. Your name, Edmund Dance. Your profession. How long have you been here? 
since the twenty-eighth of but how long have you been here that you are ignorant of all this since eighteen eleven dance shuddered this man had been four years longer than himself in prison do not dig any more said the voice only tell me how high up is your excavation on a level with the floor how is it concealed behind my bed oh what is the matter cried dance i have made a mistake owing to an error in my plans i took the wrong angle and have come out fifteen feet from where i intended i took the wall you are mining for the outer wall of the fortress but then you would be close to the sea that is what i hoped and supposing you had succeeded i should have thrown my twenty-seven you mistrust me then said dance edmund fancied he heard a bitter laugh resounding from the depths oh i am a christian cried dance guessing instinctively that this man meant to abandon him i swear to you by him who died for us that naught shall induce me to breathe one syllable to my jailers but i conjure you do not abandon me if you do i swear to you for i have got to the end of my strength that i will dash my brains out against the wall and you will have my death to reproach you all i do know is that i was just nineteen when i was arrested the twenty eighth of february eighteen fifteen not quite twenty six murmured the voice i swear to you again rather than betray you i would allow myself to be hacked in pieces you have done well to speak to me and ask for my assistance for i was about to form an i will not forget you wait how long i must calculate our chances i will give you the signal but you will not leave me you will come to me or you will let me come to you we will escape and if we cannot escape we will talk you of those whom you love and i of those whom i love you must love somebody no i am alone in the world then you will love me if you are young i will be your comrade if you are old i will be your son i have a father who is seventy if he yet lives i only love him and a young girl called mercedes my father has not yet forgotten me i am sure but god alone knows if she loves me still i shall love you as i loved my father it is well returned the voice he then gave himself up to his happiness he would no longer be alone he was perhaps about to regain his liberty at the worst he would have a companion and captivity that is shared is but half captivity plaints made in common are almost prayers and prayers where two or three are gathered together invoke the mercy of heaven all day dance walked up and down his cell he sat down occasionally on his bed pressing his hand on his heart at the slightest noise he bounded towards the door once or twice the thought crossed his mind that he might be separated from this unknown whom he loved already and then his mind was made up when the jailer moved his bed and stooped he would be condemned to die but he was about to die of grief and despair when this miraculous noise recalled him to life the jailer came in the evening dance was on his bed it seemed to him that thus he better guarded the unfinished opening doubtless there was a strange expression in his eyes for the jailer said come are you going mad again dance did not answer he feared that the emotion of his voice the jailer went away shaking his head night came dance hoped that his neighbor would profit by the silence to address him but he was mistaken the next morning however just as he removed his bed from the wall he heard three knocks he threw himself on his knees is it you said he i hear is your jailer gone yes said dance he will not return until the evening so that we have twelve hours before us oh yes yes this instant i entreat you in a moment that part of the floor on which dance was resting his two hands as he knelt with his head in the openings then from the bottom of this passage the depth of which it was impossible to measure he saw appear first the head then the shoulders and lastly the body of a man who sprang lightly one hundred ninety seven chapter sixteen
a learned Italian seizing in his arms the friend so long and ardently desired. Dance almost carried him towards the window. In order to obtain a better view of his features by the aid of he was a man of small stature, with hair blanched rather by suffering and sorrow than by age. He had a deep-set, penetrating eye, almost buried beneath the thick gray eyebrow, and a long, and still black, beard reaching down to his breast. His thin face, deeply furrowed by care, and the bold outline of his strongly marked features, betokened a man more accustomed to exercise his mental faculties than his physical strength. Large drops of perspiration were now standing on his brow, while the garments that hung about him were so ragged that one could only guess at the pattern upon which they had originally been fashioned. The stranger might have numbered sixty or sixty-five years, but a certain briskness and appearance of vigor in his movements made it probable that he was aged more from captivity than the course of he received the enthusiastic greeting of his young acquaintance with evident pleasure, as though his chilled affections were rekindled and invigorated by his contact with one so warm and ardent. He thanked him with grateful cordiality for his kindly welcome, although he must at that moment have been suffering bitterly to find another dungeon where he had fondly reckoned on discovering a means of regaining his liberty. Let us first see, said he whether it is possible to remove the traces of my entrance here. Our future tranquillity depends upon our jailers being in And with what did you contrive to make that? inquired Dance. With one of the clamps of my bedstead. And this very tool has sufficed me to hollow out the road by which I came hither, a distance of about fifty feet. Fifty feet. Do not speak so loud. Young man, don't speak so loud. It frequently occurs in a state prison like this that persons are stationed outside the doors of the cells purposely to overhear the conversation of the prisoners. But they believe I am shut up alone. I expected, as I told you, to reach the outer wall, pierce through it, and throw myself into the sea. I have, however, kept along the corridor on which your chamber. My labor is all in vain for I find that the corridor looks into a courtyard filled with soldiers. That's true, said Dance, but the corridor you speak of only bounds one. This adjoins the lower part of the governor's apartments, and were we to work our way through, we should only get into some lock-up cellars where we must necessarily be recaptured. The fourth and last side of your cell faces on faces on stop a minute. Now where does it face? The wall of which he spoke was the one in which was fixed the loophole by which light was admitted to the chamber. This loophole, which gradually diminished in size as it approached the outside, to an opening through which a child could not have passed, was, for better security, furnished with three iron bars. As the stranger asked the question, he dragged the table beneath the window. Climb up, said he to dance. The young man obeyed, mounted on the table, and divining the wishes of his companion, placed his back securely against the wall and held out both hands. The stranger, whom as yet Dance knew only by the number of his cell, sprang up with an agility by no means to be expected in a person of his years, and light and steady on his feet as an instant afterwards he hastily drew back his head, saying, I thought so, and sliding from the shoulders of Dance as dexterously as he had ascended, he nimbly leaped from the table to the ground. What was it that you thought? Asked the young man anxiously, in his turn descending from the table. The elder prisoner pondered the matter. Yes, said he at length, it is so. This side of your chamber looks out upon a kind of open gallery, where patrols are continually passing, and sentries keep watch day and night. Are you quite sure of that? I saw the soldier's shape and the top of his musket. That made me draw in my head so quickly, for I was fearful he might also see me. Well, inquired Dance. You perceive then the utter impossibility of escaping through your dungeon. Then, pursued the young man eagerly. Then, answered the elder prisoner, the will of God be done. And as the old man slowly pronounced those words, an air of profound resignation spread itself over his 
Dance gazed on the man who could thus philosophically resign hopes so long and ardently nourished with an astonishment mingled with admiration. Tell me, I entreat of you, who and what you are, said he at length. Never have I met with so remarkable a person as yourself. Willingly, answered the stranger. Indeed, you feel any curiosity respecting one? Pray let me know who you really are. The stranger smiled a melancholy smile. Then listen, said he. I am the Abbey Feria, and have been imprisoned, as you know, in this chateau since the year 1811, previously to which I had been confined for three years in the fortress of Fenestre. In the year 1811, I was transferred to Piedmont in France. It was at this period I learned that the destiny which seemed subservient to every wish formed by Napoleon had bestowed on him a son, named King of Rome even in his cradle. I was very far then from expecting the change you have just informed me of, namely, that four years afterwards this colossus of power would be overthrown. Then, who reigns in France at this moment, Napoleon, I am, no, Louis Fuzizvili, the brother of Louis A. Ha yes, yes, continued he, twill be the same as it was in England. After Charles I, Cromwell. After Cromwell, Charles I, and then James I, I uh, and then some son-in-law or relation. Then new concessions to the people. Then a constitution. Then liberty. Ah, uh, my friend, said the M, turning towards Dance, and surveying him with the kindly. It was the plan of Alexander Vi and Clement Vi, but it will never succeed now, for they attempted it fruitlessly, and Napoleon was unable to complete his work. Italy seems fated to misfortune. And the old man bowed his head. Dance could not understand a man risking his life for such matters. Napoleon certainly he knew something of, inasmuch as he had seen and spoken with him, but of Clement Vi and Alexander Vi. He knew nothing. Are you not, he asked, the priest who here in the chaitent if is generally thought to be ill? Mad, you mean, don't you? I did not like to say so, answered Dance. Well, then, resumed Feria with a bitter smile, let me answer your question in full, by acknowledging that I am the poor mad prisoner of the Chaita de Beuvie. Would it not be expecting too much to hope to succeed at your first attempt? Why not try to find an opening in another direction from that which has so unfortunately failed? Alas, in the first place, I was four years making the tools I possess, and have been two years scraping and digging out earth, hard as granite itself. Then what toil and fatigue! Whole days have I passed in these titanic efforts, considering my labor well repaid if, by night time I had contrived to carry away a square inch of this hard-bound cement, changed by... Consider also that I fully believed I had accomplished the end and aim of my undertaking, for which I had so exactly husbanded my strength as to make it just hold out to the termination of my enterprise. No, I repeat again, that nothing shall induce me to renew attempts evidently at variance with the Almighty's pleasure. Dance held down his head, that the other might not see how joy at the thought of having a... The abbey sank upon Edmund's bed, while Edmund himself remained standing. Escape had never once occurred to him. There are, indeed, some things which appear so impossible that the mind does not dwell on them for an instant. To undermine the ground for fifty feet, to devote three years to a labor which, if successful, would conduct you to a precipice overhanging the sea to plunge into the wave, but the sight of an old man clinging to life with so desperate a courage gave a fresh turn to his ideas and inspired him with new courage. Another, older and less strong than he had attempted what he had not had sufficient resolution to undertake, and had failed only because of an error in calculation. This same person, with almost incredible patience and perseverance, had contrived to provide himself with tools requisite for so unparalleled an attempt. Another had done all the... Why? 
Was it impossible to do? Seven. After continuing some time in profound meditation, the young man suddenly exclaimed, I have found what you were in search of, Faria started. Have you indeed? cried he. We must pierce through the corridor by forming a side opening about the middle, as it were the top part of a cross. This time you will lay your plans more accurately. We shall get out into the gallery you have described, kill the sentinel who guards it, and make our escape. All we require to ensure success is courage, and that you possess and strength, which I am not deficient in. As for patience, you have abundantly proved yours, you shall not. As for patience, I consider that I have abundantly exercised that in beginning every morning the task of the night before, and every night renewing the task of the day. But then, young man, and I pray of you to give me your full attention, then I thought I could not be doing anything displeasing to the Almighty in trying to set an innocent being at liberty one. Hitherto I have fancied myself merely waging war against circumstances, not men. I have thought it no sin to bore through a wall, or destroy a staircase. But I cannot so easily persuade myself to pierce a heart or take away a life. A slight movement. Is it possible, said he, that where your liberty is at stake you can allow any such scruple to deter you from obtaining it? Tell me, replied Faria, what has hindered you from knocking down your... Because, said the old man... The natural repugnance to the commission of such a crime prevented you from thinking of it. And so it ever is because in simple and allowable things, the tiger, whose nature teaches him to delight in shedding blood, needs but the sense of smell to show him when his prey is within his reach, and by following this instinct he is enabled. Two hundred nine am since my imprisonment, said Faria, I have thought over all the most celebrated cases of escape on record. They have rarely been successful. Those that have been crowned with full success have been long meditated upon and carefully arranged, such, for instance, as the escape of the Duc de Beaufort from the Chateau de Vincennes. Then there are those for which chance sometimes affords opportunity, and those are the best of all. Let us, therefore, wait patiently for some favorable moment, and when it presents itself, profit by it. I said, dance. You might well endure it. Faria saw this. When you pay me a visit in my cell, my young friend, said he, I will show you an entire work, the fruits of the thoughts and reflections of my whole life. Many of them met Mark's column at Venice, and on the borders of the Arno at Florence, little imagining at the time that they would be arranged in order within the walls of the Cheta de Diff. The work I speak of is called a treatise on the possibility of a general monarchy in Italy, and will make one large quarto volume. And on what have you written all this? On two of my shirts. I invented a preparation that makes linen as smooth and as easy to write on as parchment. You are, then, a chemist. Somewhat. I know Lavoisier. I devoted three years of my life to reading and studying these one hundred and fifty volumes, till I knew them nearly by heart, so that since I have been in prison, a very slight effort of memory, I could recite you the whole of Thucydides, Tinophon, Plutarch, Titus Livius, Tacitus, Streda, Jornin's Dant, Montaigne, Shakespeare, I name only the most important. You are, doubtless, acquainted with a variety of languages, so as to have been able to read all these. Yes, I speak, I know nearly one thousand words, which is all that is absolutely necessary, although I believe there are nearly one hundred thousand in the dictionaries. I cannot hope to be very fluent, but I certainly should have no difficulty in explaining my wants and wishes, and that would be quite as much as I should ever require. Stronger, you are aware what huge whitings are served to us on meager days. Well, I selected the cartilages of the heads of these fishes, and you can scarcely imagine the delight with which I welcomed the arrival of each Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, as a for while retracing the past, I forget the present, and traversing it will the path of history I cease to remember that I am myself a prisoner, 
but the ink said dance of what still it must have been many years in use for it was thickly covered with a coating of soot this suit i dissolved in a portion of the wine brought to me every sunday and i assure you of